here. Well, uh, I, I enjoy comedy. I've, I've always listened to comedians. It's um, almost an occupational hazard as a pastor. Uh, a lot of pastors I know, like myself, like to listen to comedians because they're one of the very few other people who do something similar to what we do, whereas they get up in front of a bunch of people and have to talk about things. And so while some comedians are crass and crude and whatever, um, methodologically in the speaking side of things, they, they can be very gifted. And so we can sometimes pick up some, some hints and presentation points. And, and one of the guys that has always cracked me up is a guy by the name of Jeff Foxworthy, right? Uh, you might be a redneck, that guy, right? And I think, it, I think it was Jeff Foxworthy. I don't, I'm not sure, but I think it was Jeff Foxworthy who first said this. He said, Thanksgiving is all about getting your entire dysfunctional family under one roof and praying that the police don't have to come, right? Now, I'm not pointing any fingers today, but, I mean, this is a safe, safe place. But, but we kind of laugh a little bit, because whether it's true about our family or not, we probably know somebody's family, where when you get everybody into one place together, it can get uh, a little bit scary. But uh, uh, we're going to be in the book of Proverbs today. You're welcome to open up a Bible. We're going to be Proverbs 15, in fact. And Proverbs 15:15 15, 15 says, All of the days of the afflicted are evil, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. And I love that last portion of that phrase. The, the, the cheerful heart has a continuous feast. People with a, with a cheerful heart ha, have Thanksgiving 365 days out of the year, right? And, and what is the secret to that? Well, then in Proverbs 15, 16, and 17, uh, King Solomon reveals two qualities that produce um, this, this, this cheerful heart. This heart that enjoys this continual feast. And these attitude of the heart are, are within reach of all of us because they do not depend on income. They don't depend upon our position or our reputation or our education or the size of our bank account or, or any other kind of worldly attainment. They're, they're not reliant upon that. We can, we can all have a, a continuous feast wherever we go if we take these two verses today to heart. So, so look at me, if you will, or look with me, if you will. You don't have to look at me, I understand. But uh, look with me at Proverbs 15, 16, and 17. Um, and it says there, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. Now check out that first word, the word better, right? Some things are better than others. We know that, right? And Solomon who was the richest man in the whole wide world, uh, certainly had wealth beyond measure, wealth beyond imagination, uh, but he's not here, he's not meaning to exalt poverty in any sort of way. He's not saying that, that being poor is preferred to wealth. I mean, honestly, if, if you ask poor people, most poor people would, if given a chance, much prefer to have some wealth, right? And, and poor people tend to often work many long hours trying to just catch up or, or get a little bit of a head. So, so this, this proverb is, is not in praise of living on the edge of financial disaster. That's not what Solomon is saying. But from the very beginning of time, there's, there's always been more rich than there has been poor, or more poor than there has been rich, right? Numerically, uh, the, the bell curve is towards the poor. There's more people at that end of the spectrum than... than uh, towards the wealthy end. And so the world's resources aren't evenly distributed, right? And, and it's really not a realistic expectation that they could be. And it doesn't matter what your political view is. Uh, it doesn't matter what the politicians try to do. It's never going to balance itself out. You can't redistribute wealth. We, we, we see the, the failed experimentation of communism in, in Russia, and, and the grand idea of that was to balance the wealth. Well, even in communist Russia, it wasn't balanced, and, and, and you can see how that system failed. And so this is less a, a statement about the way things ought to be than a statement about the way things actually are. And no doubt this is what Jesus kind of meant when he said, the poor you will always have with you in Matthew twenty six eleven. And those words, when he says those, almost seem at a degree a little bit callous, but they have to be interpreted in the same light as this proverb. And, and Jesus explains himself in the last part of that verse when he says, so he starts out by saying, the poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. And what Jesus meant was that some things matter more than other things. 
And if Jesus is among you, spend time with Him while you can, right? Then go and feed the poor. Then go and serve. Then go and feed your, 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 your you know, whatever you need to do. He's, he's basically saying, feed your spirit, then go feed the hungry. And seriously, if, if Jesus is with you, spend all the time with Him that you can, because that's going to be a limited window. And so the, the words of Solomon remind us that, that wealth is not a, a cure-all. Although, interestingly enough, if you haven't read it before, check out Ecclesiastes 10.19, because it does say in Ecclesiastes 10.19 that the answer for everything is wealth. But you have to understand context and wisdom literature to get why it says that. But, but better th- it is better to have money than none at all, of course. But, you know, the rich do have larger houses. And of course, they got nicer furnishings generally, you know. Um, they have better health care lots of times. They have more protections against trouble than those who are poor. But the truth of the matter is, death comes to them anyhow, right? The rich guy is just as dead as the poor guy when they die. And the rich get, get cancer and die just like the poor. Uh, the rich, they get divorced just like the poor. And they tend to have an even bigger mess when they get divorced, right? The rich people, they have problems with their children just as do the regular old Joes. And wealth provides only a a limited protection in this world. And wealth can't compensate for those other problems, for the breakup of marriages, for children in jail, for for sudden death or anything like that. I read about a a wealthy man once whose son had died in a plane crash. And speaking of it later on, he said, you know, Once you lose your son, you find out that there is no such thing as serious money. He said, life and death are serious. Money is not. And if we have to choose between wealth and the fear of the Lord, let us choose the latter, right? The truth of the matter is that that, that most of us won't ever even get that choice, right? The vast majority of us will never be what we at least perceive as wealthy. But we can, each and every one of us, always fear the Lord. There's another way to to look at it. Wealth, of course, by definition, is a relative term. As Americans, and we know this, we've talked about this before, but as Americans, we're pretty wealthy. And most of us, we have stuff in excess, right? Most of us do. And it's why storage units are such a booming business, right? Right? If you want to make an investment, throw up some storage units and and people will seek you out. Because we run out of space to hold all the things that we have. And then we begin to complain when we have to go through all of it to downsize as if that is a serious problem, right? It's a first world problem. Because in other places in the world, of course, people are living without food to eat. They don't have multiple changes of clothing. They don't need a, a storage unit for their stuff. When, when your house is literally made from cardboard and scraps of wood and plastic bags, right? You're not worrying about whether or not you have enough garage space. When you don't know where your next meal is coming from, life and death become a serious issue. Not money and not stuff. It's just trying to survive. And so, without question, we as Americans are blessed and we live in abundance, no matter how many numbers are in front of the period in your bank account. Right? I, got, I, I got a full column on the past the right side of my bank account, but those other columns, I could maybe use a few more commas, right? Maybe you're like me. But, but we are the wealthy man in verse 16. And, and it is, if we're honest, all a gift from God. And that includes every meal, everything we drink. Every, every time we turn water on, we have clean water, right? Like, I can walk around my house. Bathroom. Shower. Kitchen sink. There's even clean water coming out of the top of my toilet. That water is clean. Right? There's people in this world who 
who, who would do just about anything to get the, the, the water out of the top of my toilet. Not the bottom, but the top. Because that's clean, safe drinking water, and they don't have access to it. The, the, the electricity that powers all of my stuff, that turns my computer on, that runs my TV, that turns on the lights, that opens the garage door. Every book that I read, every shirt that I wear, every, every bowl of soup put before me, it's, it's all a blessing, right? And we're blessed. And Solomon doesn't ask those of us who are blessed, those of us who have more. He's not asking us to, to feel guilty about what we have. Because after all, if you even look at it, uh, there, there's differences no matter what your economic level. Even, even people who live in the slums of the, 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 the poor parts in India, if you go to one of these you know, towns of millions and millions of people, there's places of slums of hundreds of thousands of people. And, and even within those contexts, uh, even people living right next door and, and, and literally making their living by going through the garbage dump, even there there's people with differing levels of things. Someone, if you look around, someone is always going to have more than you. Someone's always going to be ahead of you. Someone's always going to be behind you. And there's always going to be some people kind of at the same level where you are. But not everything is equal. But it says that it's better to live in poverty and to know the Lord than to be the richest man in the world and to think that you did it yourself. And the rich man eventually discovers that his riches will take wings and fly, right? If he doesn't discover it in this life, when he dies, that stuff's not going with him, right? That's the old joke, you don't see a lot of trailers behind the hearse. No U-Haul's coming to bring the stuff with him, right? That's not how it works. All the stuff that the rich man worked for gets left behind just the same as it did for the guy who didn't have much to leave. And while many of us may never feel rich by our standards, the Bible is clear that that isn't the measure of what is important. What matters is that we can be rich in faith, rich in love, rich in our knowledge of the God who loves us. And if we have that, then we are truly rich. Look at Proverbs fifteen seventeen. Verse 17 says, Better is a dinner of herbs, where love is, than a fatted ox and hatred with it. Let me read to you a couple other translations of that. It says, in, in another version, Better is a meal of greens with love than a plump calf with hate. Or, or a simple meal with love is better than a feast where there is hatred. Or, or one of my personal favorite versions of this is uh, Eugene Peterson's The Message. Uh, and, and, and Eugene Peterson's always got an interesting take on things. And so Eugene Peterson writes, Better is a crust of bread shared in love than a slab of prime rib served in hate. Now, if you're serving prime rib, I love you. Invite me over. But I understand what he is saying, right? Anybody else getting hungry all of a sudden? But uh, all of these versions kind of come out in the same place, though, don't they? The most bountiful feast in the world can be ruined if the people at the table hate one another. Discord at the dinner table destroys the meal. No matter how delicious the food on the table, whether, whether it's prime rib or T-bone steaks, or, or even, even, I don't know, you could have one of these food TV, food network people come over. Cat Cora, you could have Al Alton Brown, you could have Rachel Ray come over, cook you the greatest, grandest Thanksgiving spread ever, and if everybody at the table hates one another, if they don't love one another, what good is this best food ever with a bunch of people who, who can't stand one another, who can't get along? You might as well skip that meal altogether. I mean, it's going to taste good, but you're not going to enjoy it, right? And Solomon doesn't mean to elevate poverty above wealth. Here he, he reminds us simply that, that money doesn't necessarily bring happiness. And it certainly doesn't guarantee a, a happy family or a harmonious Thanksgiving dinner. And of course, at some level, we know this. We know these things. We don't need Solomon to tell us this, because deep down we know that, that, that faith and love matter far more than money or fame. That's one of the reasons why many of you, like probably me, I don't know, you may watch It's a Wonderful Life, right? 
And, and it's why that movie remains a favorite for so many people, even this day. And, and that's an old movie. And, and, and so many people like it because when, when George Bailey, of course, who's played by Jimmy Stewart, when he's contemplating suicide on Christmas Eve, it takes the help of an angel named Clarence to, to help him see the difference his life has made. And, and, and as it happens, uh, three of the best lines in the movie come from that angel. And I'm going to share those with you. One of those ones, Clarence says, he says, Strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many other lives. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? Another one he shares is, You see, George, you've really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be just to throw it all away? And then the third one isn't actually a spoken line. It's the inscription on the book that's left for George by the angel as the movie kind of comes to its climax. And there on the book it reads, Remember, George, no man is a failure who has friends. So if we know these things, right, why does Solomon then have to remind us? Because we all need reminding, that's why. Because we all live under the spell of the big world and all of its flashing lights, its alluring games, its, its beautiful people, and all the promises of the good life that can be found on the other side of the street, right? And so, so frequently, we have deceived ourselves to think that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, right? We think that something else or something more will make us happier. So we work hard, or we go into debt, only to find out that that thing it didn't really make me happier. Or we think that that other man or that other woman uh, will make us happier than our current relationship. So we chase after that while leaving in our, our wake just, just wreckage and emotional destruction. Right? It's things that can have a negative impact for generations. And of course this is nothing new. We see it in the Bible. We see it in guys like King David. A man after God's own heart, right? But we see it in King David. And you don't even have to be king. You don't have to be rich. You, you don't have to be powerful for all these sorts of temptations to come along and wreck your life. Because bigger, better, and faster are all false gods for so many people. Those new things or this new person or whatever it is is actually not the solution. And in fact, it's often part of the problem. The grass isn't actually greener. Now, it might sound like I've kind of changed the subject here, but I really haven't because all of this is Solomon's subject. Remember, the operative word I said at the beginning is the word better, right? It's better to enjoy a, a simple meal where love abounds than to feast at the finest restaurant in Paris. It's better the, to drink simple water than to have the finest wines. It's, it's, it's better to be surrounded by people who, who truly love you and care for you and, and, and want the best for you. It's better to have that than to have all these finer things with a bunch of people that you can't stand. And many people will read Solomon and nod in agreement, but then go out and blow their lives up with a round of foolish choices. But the good news is, you and I don't have to live that way. Because Thanksgiving is always a choice. Choose today whom you will serve, the Bible says, right? Deuteronomy 30, uh, verse 19. It says, See, I have set before you today life and death. Choose life that you might live. And that's truly wonderful advice. It's first given by Moses to the, the children of Israel. But even after all of that wandering in the desert, after a whole generation of people had to die, they still continued to make the same mistakes over and over and over again, right? When I came to Psalm 78 in my uh, devotional reading recently, this is a psalm that recounts the early history of Israel. I was struck by... By, by the emphasis on how Israel kept messing things up and how God judged them, but then kept forgiving them. And then they would do it all over again. You can read it for yourself. I'm not exaggerating in the least bit, right? And, and of course, God ends up being the hero in that story. But it says in that passage of Psalm 78, it says in 40 and 41, it says, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the wasteland. Again and again, they put God to the test. They vexed the Holy One of Israel. 
the people who knew God had said, either we don't care what you think, God, or, or they'd forgotten what God had said to them, or, or we got a better idea than you do, God, and how we should go about doing this thing. So we're going to go our own way here. We're going we're to try it our way instead of your way, God, right? And that never works. God says, do it this way, and you think, no, 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 I'm going to do it this way. Does that ever work? Never. Not once. Not in the history of the world has, has God said, do it this way, and you said, I would rather do it this way. I promise you, your way is not better. But we are sinners, and so sometimes, oftentimes, too often, we choose to try it our own way. And it doesn't work. But then you, of course, come to a, a wonderful, wonderful verse like this one. Verse 52 in that Psalm 78, it says, But he brought his people out like a flock. He led them like sheep through the wilderness. That's us. You know that, but that's us. If you haven't read your Bible before, it frequently calls us sheep, right? We are God's sheep. And every time we turn around, the sheep are trying to go their own way, right? We're all trying to go our own way. We're all lost. We're all sheep without a shepherd, right? So is that in the Bible. And left to ourselves, we'll get lost, or we'll get attacked, or we'll want to wander all the way back to Egypt, or we'll start, start biting one another, right? You ever seen a sheep get ornery and start nipping at each other? Or we'll end up a supper for the wolves. We're unruly. And we don't like to be led. And sometimes we're just plain dumb. I'm not calling you dumb. God's calling you dumb. Sorry. But sometimes we are. We're a little thick skulled. But God leads his sheep all the way through the wilderness. By his grace... Eventually, we can reach it to safety. We can reach shelter if we are willing to walk with Him. So often, we think we want or we need something more. But the truth of the matter is, as long as you have God, you have exactly what it is that you need. There is a better way to live. But it depends upon us to believe in our shepherd and to believe that he knows what he is doing even when we think we have a better idea. If we have faith and if we have love, then we have exactly what it is we need in this moment. It's not more stuff. It's faith and love. I love how this is put in a, a song made famous by George Beverly Shea. If you don't know him, he's the guy who sang at all the Billy Graham crusades, right? And he seems to perfectly capture the deeper meaning of this portion of our text. I think Mike has got a video for it. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than a houses or lands I'd rather be led by his nail pierced hand Perhaps here on Thanksgiving in this season we should all say those words say them out loud I would, I would rather have Jesus then right? I would have rather have Jesus than all of these things. It's not that these things don't matter. It's not that we can't enjoy these things. But at the end of the day, I would rather have Jesus. And if we frame our thanksgiving that way, we will be truly thankful of all the things that we have, Jesus included, and then beyond that. But it starts, the pinnacle and the point and the focus of it should be thanking God for his love and for his provision for us. I would rather have Jesus than all of these things. 
I would rather have Jesus. How about you? Let's pray.